All right, well, uh, welcome uh, to a special episode of Godzilla Evangelists. Uh, we, uh, I think in the last episode, we talked a little bit about my involvement in the uh, main title sequence uh, for Godzilla vs. Kong, and uh, as well as a couple other parts. Uh, and so, as promised, here's a special episode diving deeper into that, and we have a large chunk of the team that worked uh, that I worked with on the movie, and uh, and they're all here, and we're going to talk about uh, about this crazy thing that we uh, had a part in making. Uh, so, uh, first, uh, I just want to introduce everyone. Uh, so, uh, we've got, um, and, and if you guys want to say hi, and maybe your, uh, maybe the role you, you played, uh, <laughs> your job, which is always... That's you can cut this out. It's always also fun to figure out how to how to, what to call ourselves. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we can start with uh, returning guest Ed Baker. Oh hello. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. What did... uh, I'm Ed Baker. I was the uh, I don't know what my title was on this job, but I'm an art director. On this one, I was mostly a designer and um, handwriting expert. Very true. There was a lot of handwriting and hand and hand wringing <laughs> over the handwriting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, and then uh, also we have uh, returning guest uh, Greg Jones. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm Greg Jones. I am a compositor and a finisher and an animator, and I did a little bit of all of that. A lot of finishing on on the sequence. The finisher. I can explain <laughs> later what that means. It sounds weird, <laughs> but it's it's correct. But I can explain means later. You rip what that people's means. spines out. If yes, you, exactly. Like Sam said. Yeah, it. exactly. And, and Greg, will there's I think I think uh, important context that we'll get into on this is uh, is our role, our smaller role, but our role on Kong Skull Island, which Greg also had a part in. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and and arguably a. I wouldn't say a larger role, a percentage-wise larger role, because few it was a smaller team on mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, and then we have um, now we're into new guests, uh, James Robertson, whose face I can't see. Uh, yeah. Hi, James Robertson. I did uh, I was an art director as well, as well as the uh, digital notebook uh, master, um, and I did some animating and some designing. All these titles sound so arcane. The digital notebook master. Well, the we, aren't, we aren't officially credited as these things. We're, we're giving them a little little spice. Right. You know? It's what I would prefer to be called. <laughs> to be fair, um, finisher is a real title that people have and use professionally. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah we, Greg, you keep saying that. We've all played that. Mortal Kombat. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, just, they just sound so cool. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. Uh, and then uh, Colin Parr. You've got. Hi, I am Colin Parr. I for this project, I was an animator for a lot of the the kind of techie tournament bracket part of the sequence, um, and I also designed the style frames, some initial style frames for the the Warner Brothers and Legendary logos. Yeah, we have. Uh, that's another thing we'll get into a little bit. Is is we did. Uh, the the logo design at the beginning, main title, and also the uh, Apex uh, corporate film, uh, and then last Mulan. Uh, hi. Mulan, I, you... Oh, go ahead. No, that's my. I'm being a horrible host. <laughs> and last we have we have Mulan. Uh, hi, I'm Mulan. Uh, I won't say my whole name. It's really long, but um, I was a designer and an illustrator. I did a little bit of typography, and I was also kind of an A plus at bad design too, which we can get into later. Yeah, that's that's a fun a fun thing we'll definitely get into is the intentional bad design that never saw the light of day. Uh, is oh. pretty mm -hmm. fun. Uh, Mulan, you should say for... your whole name so we can hear it for the record. Yeah, do you want the so whole? That... Do you want the whole whole name? Yeah, say yeah. your name. This your name. Okay. Why not? My name is Mulan Angelica Yudi Leong Suzuki. Awesome. So, That's yeah. an amazing name. My mom said uh, she named me that so that I'd have almost every letter in the alphabet by the time I was you know, <laughs> in the school. Uh, and then my name is um, Samuel Xylophone Zebra <laughs> Schlinger. Uh, <laughs> All of the letters. No, and then I, uh, and then you guys know me. So, uh, and that, that rounds out our group. Um, 
so uh so we work for a company uh called you and company who uh you know basically that's that's the umbrella we worked under to to make to do these jobs uh ed do you want to give a little background on how yuko slash kind of um motion graphics companies sort of work because it's not a thing i think people generally understand you know yeah yeah, yeah true um i mean if you're if you're listening to this you probably know what a title sequence is because you watched godzilla versus kong uh but a lot of times we have to explain what what the job even is and like the easiest thing is to say james bond movies right there's a title sequence at the beginning that starts the movie off um and what a lot of people don't know is the the filmmakers don't don't usually do that because that's not their skill set and they bring in a company like us uh, to create a title sequence, um, which, you know, they are, well, there's varying degrees of how involved they are, but, um, they'll bring us cause we, we have the expertise in graphic design, uh, motion graphics, typography, all those things. So there's a lot of different kinds of title sequences. This one was, it had a little more story to it than some where we want to set up this, uh, history of Kong and Godzilla and uh, you know establish this rivalry and then kind of get the audience amped up for the, the big battle that was to come and um, yeah in general what we do is we pitch ideas so we go in we pitch a, a different ideas for what the title sequence would be the filmmakers uh, usually the director will decide what you know which direction to go in and then um, we we do our thing yeah, and and I think uh, in this case, we, we I guess we still kind of pitched, but it was a it was actually hilariously we didn't start with the main title. We actually earlier on pitched on just the Apex uh, corporate commercial, mm-hmm. and then it, the main title kind of came later because I don't know that they planned on having a main title sequence for this movie. I think it was kind of a, it was kind of open, uh, and I and I think that maybe we even kind of pitched like. Here's if we did one. If you had mm-hmm. one, this is kind of what it would be. Uh, I don't think it was. It was like you know. I don't think it was even like ah, pitch us main title because we need one, um, which is interesting because it it seems so. It's such yeah. a big chunk of the, the beginning of the movie. It seems right. like if you guys want a more premium intro to your film, <laughs> please let us do the title <laughs> sequence. That's actually really interesting because <laughs> I thought it was like almost a natural continuation of the one in Kong Skull Island. So I was like, oh, of course. Like it was just like planned all along so that's really interesting to know that you guys helped nudge them in that direction yeah no it's it's uh it's funny we we worked on so so sometimes there are multiple companies like like us on a movie so on skull island uh there was a different company that did the intro one and then we did more of like the 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 main i mean we, we talked about this on the episode about that movie but the uh the, the title crawl with all those cave paintings was a matte painter you know, that we worked with who designed that, you know, the type design, you know, that kind of stuff. But the actual, like, opening sequence was actually a different company uh, that also did the 2014 Godzilla. So it's so it's interesting. We, we kind of worked on that one, and that was kind of our in, and then on this one we had a bigger role uh, on a couple different things. Um, so maybe we can get into the kind of, like, the, the sort of story. Uh, James and Ed, I'll definitely you know, chime in wherever it is appropriate, but kind of like the story of our sequence, right? It's a, it's a two and a half to three minute long, uh, main title that broadly is like a mixed media, uh, sort of mixed media, all, all sorts of stuff, basically exploring, uh, scientists tracking Godzilla and Kong's rivalry through time would be the way I'd describe it. I don't know if there's uh, any other way to describe it. Uh, and so we, we kind of start with, uh, with like a scientist journal, which James will certainly speak to because that was his his baby, uh, and uh, and kind of like different artworks, uh, th- you know, throughout history of d- in different cultures, kind of ancient cultures uh, that are showing Kong and Godzilla as ancient rivals. Which I think there's a kind of a we, it's kind of a continuation of what we saw in the movie uh, uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters. There are moments right. of that. I think this is just an, an extension of that. Um, there's definitely some hollow earth, uh, stuff then in the next section, which would be your, uh, kind of scientists talking about hollow earth expeditions 
you know, traveling to Antarctica to find the, the entry point, which is very funny because that, that, uh, Antarctica expedition stuff from the early 1900s is all very real. We just we just had to kind of kind of twist it out of context to make it seem like they were looking for a hollow earth hole uh, instead of just going to Antarctica because no one had been there before. Um, we uh, we mentioned we kind of get into Skarsgård there with uh, with his with his book and his kind of failed expedition. We have hints of that. Right. Uh, we kind of break our timeline a little bit, but it's it topic wise makes sense there. Uh, and then we get into kind of like a, like a microfiche uh, sort of world with with kind of photos and videos of the like reemergence of Kong and Godzilla in their respective twentieth century eras, with uh, you know Godzilla showing up in the fifties slash sixties and Kong in the seventies. Uh, and then we get into current day where we go full digital. Uh, sort of like that what once was a scientific notebook is now like this computer uh you know database with crazy 3d models and and stuff uh that uh that's basically uh kind of breaking down the two of them all the monsters they've defeated and kind of you know gets us into (laughs) resolves into apparently these scientists their program is is designed to look like a giant tournament bracket uh like the playoffs and uh (laughs) and (laughs) And that's and then we dive into a virtual hollow earth and uh, get the logo. So that's that's I think the gist of it. I I really loved the um, different like artworks of Kong and Godzilla. Like seeing like them like in different cultural viewpoints, different works through time. I was like, oh, that's that's perfect. That's and they looked so cool. Did did you guys come up with the artwork, or did you get that from an outside source? Or Mulan and Ed, oh. you want to take this one? Mulan. Ed, you want, okay, well, so yeah, we depending on the one that we had, we had we had other um, cultures too that we even tried. So we tried like Egyptian, and I think there was um, the we had the, I can't remember Ed what they were called. There were like mounds and stuff, but we basically just kind of went through um, different types of old artworks and things, and just kind of figured like, is there kind of a reptilian creature here? Is there kind of like a <laughs> kind of like a basically a big monkey that we can like kind of like come together? So like, <laughs> I guess. I guess specifically, um, I worked mostly for that section on like the Chinese kind of painting one. So like, again, it's like taking really ancient artworks that like actually exist and kind of like kind of seeing if we can fit them together and then like using a bunch of Photoshop brushes to basically just kind of like bring everything back together again. Um, We also had like a matte painter who actually did like some of the uh, maybe some of the other better ones that weren't just like comp together. But um, yeah, like we had a lot of like little creatures, too, I think. um, Lydia, she was another illustrator, she basically just went through and was like, we were just basically given like silhouettes of other type of like um, titans and stuff and just kind of like, Mm -hmm. kind of tracing it out and just kind of like putting them in kind of like little Easter eggs just kind of all over the place. So each one's basically a big painting that you can like kind of look through. That's right. I definitely, oh, go ahead, Joanna. No, you go first, Ryan. Okay. I definitely noticed that seeing this three times now, I'm like, oh, I could just like pause this and like look at all this and... Um, we might get to this later, but especially all the um, redacted text. I'm like, oh, it goes by so fast. I wonder what's there. But I didn't have time to pause and get to every individual frame. But I definitely noticed like Mothra in one of the paintings on my third watch. And I'm like, oh, yes. Lovely. Ryan's favorite call out. <laughs> she's my uh, second favorite monster. After um, exactly. Um, yeah, I-, I was wondering too, because watching it back a few times, you know, it's like a, a three minute sequence or however exactly long it is but there's so much going on in every single frame so um how long does a sequence like this typically take like how long do you guys have for a project like this knowing all the research and artwork that and editing that goes into it it's it's, you know it's never as the crow flies you know what i mean uh (laughs) i think uh we definitely and we can get into this uh for sure but we definitely kind of did an entirely different approach and then abandoned it and then did something else but i'd say at least three months four months Greg, does that sound kind of right yeah i think so yeah i mean we so we started it was all this was mostly done in the first couple months of quarantine so we were all like we were getting used to um uh working you know in our home offices and, and you know you know when the quarantine started and everything was fresh and you're like oh it's so weird to be indoors all the time and like we're just sitting like working <laughs> on the last this for two movie. weeks yeah <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. 
yeah um but we so uh, we definitely it, it started with you know meetings with the the te- you know, the the director and, and editor and producers you know multiple times um kind of like a, a, maybe end of 20 uh, mostly early 2020 and then um and then you know so so we definitely met with them so it started before everything shut down but um most of the uh, version of the sequence that you actually see here was done while we were locked in our homes. Mm-hmm. So March to about uh, uh, end of June. Right, because you guys were originally shooting for that November date, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I can't remember for sure, but I think that I think when we did the commercial, started the commercial uh, like at the very beginning of 2020, because again, that was first. Um, I think that we still thought that it was going to be a 2020 release. And then I think by the time we were getting into the main title, I think we knew that the movie had been pushed a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I I remember going to watch um, a screener at Legendary with you, Sam, and Mm -hmm. um, they kind of showed us the movie and then asked us what, what we didn't understand, and that was kind of what they wanted the main title to help convey... So mm-hmm. part of what we didn't understand was Hollow Earth, or me specifically did not understand Hollow Earth, kind of the, how far back this rivalry grow, goes, and then also like why Kong was in a dome. <laughs> I remember those th- <laughs> being the three things that yeah. confused me. <laughs> yeah, that last it, one still, <laughs> mm, that's not your fault. Valid, valid question. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. It's funny that that's often to Ed's point about how much story we have. It that's often the the way that these work is kind of like, hey, maybe in this main title we can clarify some some questions in the movie. But what's really interesting is a lot of times you start it early enough in the process where those things also get solved on their end by just editing the movie or ADR. And so it, there's a little like push and pull of kind of like, you know, how how much we need to to show in in our part and how much we don't. So there, I think there was some of that where we. I think, you know, we didn't end up having to do a ton of dome stuff, except showing that Kong was in a dome and there were some storms on Skull Island. I think, like, that was kind of the extent of it. Um, but I, I know that they also did a lot, on, you know, between the time that we saw that, that cut and, and the end to just improve that. But, yeah, that's, that's often kind of what happens mm-hmm. is, is what, can we, what can we help clarify. Yeah, unfortunately, I... I didn't notice it on my first watch, but I do appreciate having seen it again. How you introduce Skarsgård there, uh, I'm like, oh, okay. It's nice that there's setups for that. But uh, on my first watch, I did notice other setups, like just the, of course the idea of the rivalry coming together was like the main theme that was like in my head. Um, but also the idea of. Uh, like the intensity heating up like when we left things at the end of king of the monsters they were relatively relatively peaceful for a giant monster world <laughs> and when we pick back up here like this shit's crazy again so i i, I like that it set that tone as well uh, do you, sam and, and james do you guys want to talk about the first version the the more conspiracy theory based version yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> We we originally pitched this idea that uh, we thought was a really good idea. Uh, it would it was going to all take place on a computer screen and kind of just just show the conspiracy theory and kind of um, fan re- reaction to Kong and Godzilla. Um, and so it was this. We we edited this. We made all these frames of, you know, crazy conspiracy theorists on YouTube talking about Hollow Earth, and you know, fourteen year old boys in their bedroom saying who would win, uh, Godzilla or Kong. <laughs> and it just we. I remember Ed and I going on this extreme deep dive of conspiracy theories and fan videos, yeah. and uh, just falling down a huge rabbit hole with that. <laughs> Our whole yeah, audience if, is like, no, why didn't that make it in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so on that, uh, yeah, so is it, I, I think that it, I, the the current, the perspective of the final sequence, which was the kind of the second, the pivot idea we did, is almost like, uh, it's a little bit like the perspective of, um, of um, ah, what's her name? Monarch. I'm so sorry. Um, 
who's our who's our uh rebecca hall oh yeah yeah rebecca hall is yeah so like she has a journal it's it's not like really her perspective but it's like a monarch perspective and the original idea we had was bernie's perspective uh and so it was kind of like what would happen if he if he did a if he was just you know finding all this crazy stuff that was like you know oh apex is doing this evil stuff and you know all these like secret plans from apex and all these you know uh you know, like cons- more conspiratorial Kong versus Godzilla stuff. Now, now we did still have ancient artworks on like web pages and stuff. So a lot of that ancient artwork stuff we just kind of like framed in a different way. Uh, you know, uh, which I, and again, I think I think everyone thinks that what we had, that the the final one was the right call. Um, but uh, but yeah, we we had you know the the thing that we didn't end up having in the final one was this whole like in the world of the movie people think godzilla or kong will win like everyone's aware the the general population are aware that godzilla and kong hate each other it's like it's everyone knows this <laughs> and so we were like repurposing videos of like little british kids being like i think godzilla would win <laughs> and like and making it like no he means in the movie in, in the context of the movie he thinks godzilla will win um and uh, and ryan I don't know if you remember this, but I, I asked you if you had any like second grade drawings you made of <laughs> Godzilla and or Kong, and I was just sent them all over. And because the thought was like, you know, kid, you know, in, in somewhere on the internet, kids are drawing like fan art of the real Godzilla and Kong, right. and you know why not? Uh, so sorry that it didn't your your second grade. I know work that, use. that's a heartbreak. <laughs> At least your voice is in there. Um, yeah. But I guess is is anybody else's voice in there actually? I might as well ask that. One other, there's one other uh, who guy who isn't on on this call. Okay. Um, Rick is is a voice, the kind of like newscaster about uh, people didn't still no word on what may have happened or something. There's a a line about the uh, Scarsgard's brother dying. Right. And he, Sam, he when I went back well. and listened to that four more times. I laughed out loud every time. It just made me so, and I wanted to ask, I know that you didn't, you know, you weren't getting your Hollywood payout. Like, was John Goodman's voice in that? Was he getting paid for using his voice there? So, yes, he was. And it was my call to put him his voice in there. Well, it was a that good was throwback. A, that was. Yeah, it was nice I connective it. tissue. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. um, it's it, not, not like because I thought it would be good connective tissue, but just because it was early enough that we just needed something to explain what we were seeing that's always how it goes like well what you know what are we hearing the supporting this stuff and so it was like i went through the the previous movies and found some lines that i thought might kind of like help build out this the, the story of the sequence and support it and so and that ended up making it in the and final. john goodman thanks you for his residuals yeah exactly <laughs> but can we clarify sam what what your voice sounded like can you just give us a taste? Um, I already so on the on the episode Let's about the film. Let's hear it again, Sam. I, uh, Come I, on, I, we're I talking about it. the title. Come on. I'm sorry, but I don't remember the line. <laughs> <laughs> Was it pitched like, up in post, or did you adjust your voice when you did it? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> hey, uh, we we I met Sam in an improv class I think so uh, you know yeah it's, it's one of the two know. voices I can do no uh Colin I don't think it was pitched up I think I EQ'd it a lot uh to kind of make it sound old and radio-y and I think I probably just took out a lot of the low end oh. um but I don't think I pitched it up that at all that makes sense because they talk about that with like the famous oh the humanity like his voice actually didn't sound mm. like that it's like just the quality of the recording at the time um Feel free to just say this is a question that we can't talk about, but was part of the reason they went in a different direction because conspiracy theories became less funny over the last six months. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. Is I don't think so. No. Okay. I think I. I actually just think it was. Pro- it probably. It really. It probably doesn't fit with the the movie that as as well i think that it you know maybe a bit and actually i think that it came back uh, a little bit and you know certainly mulan with the type you can definitely talk about this and you know and james is in it as well like a lot of it is it's even though it's a more kind of modern and sci-fi take on than the previous movies you don't want it to feel too far and i think that something like that that's like all like the dark web and you know spazzy you know compressed imagery and stuff is like just probably felt like it's just a different series well i think too 
in our recording last week, we were like, what if this movie, just Bernie had just been the main character and that had, you know, that would have been a perfect setup for it. But I hear you on them needing to maybe tone it back a bit. And then you find out that all of the movies in the series have been in his head. <laughs> <laughs> he's just me. He's just an obsessive Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, his laptop. What a twist! <laughs> that, it, oh, that would be so great. What a, fans would be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I was speaking of getting fans mad. Do we want to talk about the bracket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's do it. So I have to start with a clarifying question because I've seen people say this. I personally don't believe this was the case, but if it is, I, I'm going to get mad. <laughs> is the implication of the bracket that Godzilla has killed all those monsters? I'll, I'll talk <laughs> speak to this because I was the one who put those monsters in there. <laughs> uh, the source. No, I don't think okay. so. They've, that, ju- that they've just been intention. defeated. <laughs> yeah, they've been defeated. Yeah. Emotionally defeated. <laughs> uh, and, and actually, and, and also, I think, I think, I'm not looking at the sequence right now, I think that the implication was that Ghidra defeated Methuselah. And mm. that would have had to have happened in the process of the last movie. Right. Um, and again, didn't kill him because we see him at the end of the movie. I saw people, you know, people really getting, going nuts about this and like, well, why didn't we see it? And it's like, well, obviously, you know, like, come on, guys. Like, obviously, that's not how... We don't go back in time when we make movies. Like, they couldn't have put <laughs> retroactively put that in the movie. But, like, the thought was that, yeah, that, that it just means defeated. It doesn't mean killed, necessarily. Okay. Release the Methuselah Good. cut. Because I've seen people get <laughs> confused with that. Like, I watched Red Letter Media, and that's what they thought. They thought Godzilla had killed Mothra and Rodan and all that. In the and then Ryan movies, would have to cry. Like, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> His whole world would be thrown upside down. Godzilla's a good but guy. That's, Come on. that's not what happened. Um, no. It, it, okay. So what what are people were. getting mad about? Was it just the Methuselah Ghidorah thing, or that certainly I saw talk of that. I think uh, I think that there was some discrepancy or some some argument about the the size and weight of some of the monsters that are listed in the database. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but but I, I think in our defense, uh, I mean Ed, unless you think differently, I think that their size and weight sort of changes with every movie based on the convenience of the store. I mean, it's, you know, you know, it's seasonal. That... They they get like all of us, right? I mean, they gain a couple of tons <laughs> over the holidays. Like they, they Kong yeah. had serious sciatica that he had corrected and now he's 40 feet taller. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah, I mean, we did we did try to uh do our research. Uh we did our research, but like we were finding different things from different sources and, and even the ones that are from the studio it's like mm-hmm. so we just did our best so deal with it nerds yeah. <laughs> i love the internet it shows how much people care you know it's it's i love it True. yeah sam do you remember um mudo's well the the cause of death i wanted to put in N- no but you but we should was, tell what the final was, one is do we do we change it we, it had to get changed right to the well, actual well it's kiss of death yeah, but uh, there was one point when I was just, I said the cause of death was just wanting to have a family. <laughs> <laughs> that rocks. I love that. Who, who was in charge of all the little, uh, all the sentences surrounding the crew? Like this one, reality is stranger than anything in a screenplay by a raving lunatic and makes Eric Pearson and Max Borenstein seem credible by comparison. <laughs> I screenshotted all of these and loved every one of them. Ah, uh, you it actually looked at so all of them? so fast. Yeah, like it's like uh, the something, the monster sounds are compared to music by Tom Holkenberg. Like I just yeah. appreciated every single one of them. So was your team responsible for that? Yeah, I I think I wrote most of those. Um, Amazing. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Thanks so, so much for the work there. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm definitely gonna have to go back and, and look at all of them. Yeah. yeah. So I I have some regrets. Uh, not in, it's it was too late by the time I thought of it. But um, late in the process of us working on this was when I find when we watched Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, mm-hmm. and I wanted for the executive produced by Yoshimitsu Bano, I wanted to uh, see if Ed could swap that line to be something about pollution in honor of him. 
yes. uh, but it was we were very late in the process and it was yeah. just like i i don't think i'm gonna upend everybody all the all of the finishers greg in, <laughs> yeah. in their finishing of the movie just for this for this one line <laughs> that's too bad though that would have been a great little tribute for him James, the, there was a lot. the The journal stuff was a was a big, was a big thing. The, oh, yeah. the kind of like look of that, and kind of like finding a modern way to do a book. Like, you know, the old the old school title sequence thing is oh, it's a book and it opens. But like, it's like what is the the modern way of doing that that looks like it could be in this movie? So James, I don't know if you have stuff to share on that. That was a whole a whole thing. Yeah. The um. The whole notebook at the beginning was fun because we we had just like everyone had just locked down when we started thinking about how we were going to do it. So pretty much shooting it practically was was off the table, <laughs> and um, so it, I I was tasked with figuring out how a way to make a like a CG book, and um, I had a lot of fun with it because Ed had some beautiful handwriting, and I just kind of. I kind of filled up this notebook full of a bunch of a bunch of random things. There's like some Polaroids that you can just barely see that are like of my fiance and there's <laughs> paper clips and little notes that I just scanned in. So it's a lot of stuff that you can't see because they get cropped out in the end. But um, yeah, so it was a lot of fun. And our first cut pass at it was a very like typical weathered looking book. And at some point, the note came back that it needs to be neon, and uh, and so I was just like, oh god, how do you make this book neon? Um, we ended up using a lot of lens flares and just kind of um, casting some neon lights on it. And then Sam did a great job editing it together with some like inverting the colors and adding some really crazy looking v- VHS effects in there. So um, mm-hmm. it was it was kind of like a something that we would shoot practically, and then ended up being way better by the ability to change everything in the end. Yeah, I um, I thought it was real. So it was completely convincing as like a physical object. There you go, we win. <laughs> <laughs> I love too all the like, <laughs> all the crafting that goes into it. You scan in, uh, in photos of your fiance. Uh, yeah. I, all yeah. those details are That's hilarious. Cute. And the, Ed's name is actually in there too at some point. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> I forget what, what it says, but it's, uh, he's a professor. It says Professor Ed Baker. Yeah, I, th- I think I used E.J. Baker to be more uh, E.J. Personal. Baker. Yeah. Very formal, fancy. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that one of the uh, uh, one of the VHSs of the people diving into Hollow Earth has not not the y- the correct year, but has my birthday in it. Mm-hmm. So steal my identity, nerds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come for it. We've got his no, voice it, on tape. <laughs> and so, somewhere in there, yeah, I know. Are there any references to the pre-legendary movies that you squeezed in there? I didn't explicitly notice any, but I thought I would ask. I gotta think on this. Okay. <laughs> because Editing I feel break. like the answer is yes, but I'm not, I should remember where they may have been. Um, this is entirely going back to something else, I guess, but since we're just sitting here, I do have uh, the, um, we made a Church of Kongism page for the cult one originally. I have that on my phone right now. If you want me to read <laughs> off one of the descriptions that we had. Yes, oh, absolutely. Please, of yeah. course. Okay, so basically it's a web page. It's covered in bananas and it's completely black and it has Kong's face in the center of it. And it's the church, <laughs> it's the church of Kongism and it's, he who can crush us with his hand overpowers us all. Join us and recognize the one true power. Um, the king will prevail and save us all. Once we were like him, but we've lost our way. Born from the same fruit, our ancestors stifled their potential and shrank. We must recognize our purpose to serve. It is the next natural step in evolution, and he has come to collect us. Wow. Okay. So that was something that got taken out. That's I'm, awesome. And I'm it would have been start- especially... Oh, go ahead. Especially applicable. I'm going to start every episode with that statement. We all know I'm a huge Kong fan. I uh, know, we're forming a, a sect within the Godzilla mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, When are we going to yeah. see the Church of Kongism movie? <laughs> well, we've got was, this uh, logo, so, you know, we could just throw that in there. <laughs> I, so, uh, Ryan, to answer your question about the, uh, the previous movie references, there was something... Uh, not in the main title. There was actually a reference to a previous one in um, in the Apex commercial, uh, which I can I can briefly get into. I don't think there's as much to say here, but um, 
but that was again the first thing we pitched it it's uh it was a combination of like it's a lot of like uh like stock footage um that you know you know that i found and, and treated kind of like the way we do corporate commercials generally which is like it's you know it's it's just collections of people you know walking through fields of wheat and silhouette and you know and and uh actually though the way it opens is a direct ripoff of two different uh corporate films we've worked on uh you know some of us have worked on together where it's their logo of the company and then you pull out and it's reflected in a little girl's eye like it <laughs> like we've done that unironically multiple times and it was like well this is that that was actually later that was something where we had to figure out a good way to start it because it was originally going to start in a different way in the cut and it, it ended up being like well we need to start it have it have it come on over black in some way and so i was like oh the logo kind of traces on like the tesla logo the avex logo traces on like the, the, the tesla logo and then pull out of a little girl's eye was an addition it was something we came up with later um but there was a shot at one time this that commercial which is now very short uh and and probably right rightly so uh it was uh it was longer and had a little more kind of like uh Apex has been helping rebuild the world since the monsters in the last movie attacked. That was kind of like the angle it was a little bit more. Like now it's it's m- much less so. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were some shots um, of kind of like time lapses of um, which is a very like like corporate film thing to have like time lapses of cities um, and of kind of like cities being rebuilt in kind of high tech ways. And there was a shot that was something that I was really proud of, and so of course it didn't make it in the final thing, uh, that we worked on, uh, and it was a lot of work, uh, and it was a time lapse that we built frame by frame, a lot of it in CG, of the of the world has been, you know, like it was in, in Boston, like the end of the last movie, mm-hmm. uh, of like the world has been kind of leveled by these monster fights, and now Apex is helping rebuild, and it was rebuild, and it was one shot where it was sort of like a leveled, you know, kind of destroyed area of Boston, and in time lapse you see monsters just zipping around like the way that jets and like cars look in in time lapse, zipping around through this scene, and then they kind of clear out, and then the city builds back up with you know like the sun being in a different position every, you know, every frame. And that was a huge, difficult shot, and we, we did a, a good chunk of it. Um, and in that, in you know, of those kind of monsters that we see zipping through a few frames through the frame, a couple of those were uh, were kind of like references to monsters from the OG series. There would be one, but they're only visible for a couple frames. It wasn't like a uh, like you know a really like obvious one. It was kind of like a little Easter egg. But then again, that didn't actually make it. Uh, so, which is that was another fun. shame. But which which OG monsters were you referencing? I truly don't remember. <laughs> ah. You um, have to black it out once they cut it because he was too sad. <laughs> had to repress the memory. Yeah. Yeah. I hope Baby Godzilla. Yeah, was I, one I, of I can't remember. Oh, yes, I hope God. Minya was. In there. <laughs> and I can tell you for a fact it was not. If Sam was in charge. He was not involved. <laughs> There's no way. Snuffleupagus was in there, wasn't he? I think so. <laughs> Snuffle- yeah, you're right. You know Godzilla versus Snuffleupagus. Yeah. <laughs> 1973. Godzilla, my, my Godzilla just gets bored and depressed and walks away. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever his official name is. But you know who I'm talking about when I say snuffle up with this. <laughs> yeah, there's a big mammoth uh, yeah. titan. I don't, I don't remember the name. Oh, either. I thought you meant the real one. <laughs> that would be cool. That, that would also be cool. Um, is, there, is there anything else you wanted to say about the, the Apex commercial? Which is very funny when you think of it as like a corporate commercial. Yeah, I I have something I want to mention, which is that for the signature of Walter Simmons, uh, Mulan and I worked very hard researching psychopath signatures and like trying different handwriting to to give the right one, and um, and eventually we got it. And uh... a large number of corporate CEOs came up on that list and their signatures. So you know, what does that say? Yep. Sam said that there were elements of Adolf Hitler and Donald Trump in there in the la- in the final. Version. Yeah, I was trying not to name names, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. We've already sorry not up. not to badmouth Hitler, <laughs> all of the people who would be offended <laughs> by that. <laughs> Colin, uh, so Colin, you you did a lot of the the look of the digital stuff in the main title, right? The kind of like 
the windows, the frames in the in the system, and kind of like the way they move. Do you have anything on that? That's kind of a because because I, I feel like you that was a lot of stuff you just kind of came up with. Yeah, the trick there was to have everything be moving a little bit, kind of in its own way. So you have there are a lot of digital. A lot of the brackets have these sort of browser window icons at the top, and I think those were based on um, these quick times that the studio sent us of windows that they actually played back on set. But because mm -hmm, they were right. quick times, I think Mulan and some of the other designers rebuilt those so that we could animate them our own way and have them just kind of blink or have some of the numbers. Um, Kind of, I know a lot of the model. I remember a lot of the models, like we have those wireframe models of the, of the, of the previous monsters that do a little turnaround, uh, and those were, those were also from them. And they, they sent us the actual production mm -hmm. models, which were way too many polygons to be able to work with. So we, we had a, one of a, one of the three D people, like, looked at them and kind of cleaned them up. Um, and then we retimed them. I was, I, I was, I had the kind of spin on them. I tried to put a kind of spin on them so that it feels sort of responsive and UI-ish, so it kind of starts quick and sort of slows down. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that always stands out to me, I'm not sure this is, this is a sort of weird technical stuff I get excited about, but um, you have the kind of rainbow Dopplery weather system that shows up over Skull Island. Um, mm -hmm. That was I made that from scratch using a particle system and a yes. series of um, of kind of posterizy effects. Um, so that's that's was always that was a that's always a fun exercise when you have a photographic or real world element that you need to try to figure out how to create and match the look of. That's I, awesome. I remember opening up that file thinking that you just like stole some kind of jpeg of a doppler radar <laughs> and i opened it up and my mind was just blown by all the things you had in there and how much time you must have spent on the doppler i was like oh god close this file immediately <laughs> yeah, i was way i'm glad i'm glad nobody had to to change it or do anything with it um yeah i think i was uh, just waiting for one of the cg things to render and i thought oh, let's see what we can do here um yeah, I, this is a, just a general thing I think that we all had to deal with, um, but just broadly with the main title, you know, it, it's in a lot of ways, it's similar to the 2014 Godzilla sequence and also the uh, Skull Island one. You know, we, we obviously referenced those as mm -hmm. kind of like this is the kind of like mixed media, you know, stills and overlays of writing and stuff. But the big difference was those are th those have odd, like like footage you know archival footage things that exist that are in them so it's like you know oh yeah like like you know skull island is about like you know an era of discovery so you you know there's tons of footage of like stuff from the 60s and 70s of people you know like and it's all you know quotes from from jfk and like you know it's an era of discovery you know here's scientists discovering this thing and doing this you know journey and in this there you know it's like it's about the history of monsters who have an ancient rivalry and hollow earth, which nothing exists th that, you know, to like use for that. So it was a right. lot like, I think for all of us, it was like, how do we, you know, it's like, like what footage, you know, do we have to make or, sh you know, use or shoot, you know, that, or like, like twist the context of, uh, so it was like, it was a funny thing. It was actually like a, a very difficult thing to actually have concrete things we can show, you know? And so like with the Doppler thing, all the stuff that had to be created from scratch, for it or or heavily 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 twisted out of context yeah you guys really put your hands in it and it's um it shows i think this is definitely the most exciting of the opening sequences that we've had so far um and to go back to the spin arounds i really i really liked that and i thought it was funny because it was very much like a introduction to like a boxing match like a pay-per-view boxing match <laughs> like here's the height way the record Let's get a full view of their body which is funnily enough kind of like a spiritual callback because in some of the promotional materials for the original king kong versus godzilla they would take quotes from them uh like they were sumo wrestlers and like how do you feel about like 
fighting this opponent and like talking about how big they were so it was like a weird spiritual echo over 50 years <laughs> oh yeah i feel like we actually referenced some of those for like the look of the final lockup mm -hmm. when you yeah. have the two of them i think i think we did that that's, that's like sort of a uh, the the two faces them facing each other head to head with the earth in the middle is like a like the most modern version of like a really old poster you could do mm -hmm. It's too bad we couldn't have, like, uh, the trash talk and the face-off. And... <laughs> yeah. The way in. The way in. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Is that the one where they stand, like, an inch away from each other's faces? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> On March um, 31st, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Get ready. Uh... So I think the last thing we haven't covered is the um, Warner Brothers and Legendary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all James and Colin. I mean, not all of them, but you guys should talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, those were fun. It, 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 the way that process works is that we come up with a few different concepts uh, to show the the, the studio. And um, I, I designed one, Colin designed one. I think we had a few others uh, being designed, but it was pretty clear right at, uh, at the start that <laughs> Colin was going to win. Uh, his designs <laughs> were just like kind of perfect with the digital kind of circuitry that expands out from the logo. Um, and like the, you know, separating Kong and Godzilla into their own like atmospheres and um, environment. Uh, so yeah, it was just kind of a stroke of genius on Colin's part. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I thought... director. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go. Yeah, the director, um, which we we saw this like looking at his past films that he tends to to like this sort of um, almost psychedelic neon look. Um, so that was kind of inspiring to me. It was how how complex and colorful can i can i make this neon thing yeah and it it kind of the idea and it's funny now but the idea of that was to you know the the like it's a natural world where some like evil tech stuff sort of takes it over like a virus was supposed to be like a really subtle like hint that mecca was coming yeah yeah um which which i think you know it, in the end i don't know that i think ever you know most people knew that mecca was coming by the time the movie came out uh, but but that I was actually kind of the idea. The whole time I working on it, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. They're like, I saw this really great callback. He's like, no, nah, I had not a clue, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I well, thought too, was... though. I thought it looked. It was very cool. How then, when Kong was in, I always want to call it Middle Earth. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Hollow Earth. Yeah, Hollow yeah Earth. He's, when he's in Mordor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And he gets the weapon and it has you know the, the when the godzilla uh glow is kind of coming up while he's in that space i was thought it was a cool throw to that and also yeah. seeing it made me so fucking sad that i wasn't in a theater the whole the logos and then the whole mm -hmm. intro sequence because yeah. we were we were we were like do we do it do it and then my one friend he was like none of the seats available are good we're not sitting in these awful seats and mm -hmm. so then i didn't watch it in the theater, but um, I was like, "Damn, this would have looked so fucking cool." I'm Soon. I'm seeing it at a drive-in tonight. Oh, yeah, nice! That oh, would be fun. great. <laughs> uh, so, on the subject of seeing it in the theater, I feel like uh, Greg, we never actually you never explained what what a finisher <laughs> was. Oh, uh, and also that that applies to you. A lot of how it how it actually looks in the end is, is all you. So I think what better way than to finish on the finisher? <laughs> sure. So if I can try to explain it in a way that's, you know, really clear and not too confusing, it's just that, you know, when they make these movies, uh, professional movies, they're trying to pull in a lot of information. You know, you think about, I give this analogy of take like your television or your laptop or your your phone and look at a picture of you know the sky or a sunset and then you take that and you walk outside and put it up to like an actual sky and sunset and it's it's a lot brighter like the real real life 
is, is a lot more information, a lot more brightness and detail than what you can put on your screen. But yet somehow, you know, when you come back into your, your home, you look at your TV, it still looks like a sunset. It doesn't look like a dim sunset. It just looks like a sunset to you. And so there's a lot that has to happen, you know, mathematically and physically in order for that cheat to work so that you can see a, a sunset or something on the screen and it looks just like real life even though it actually is nothing like real life. And a lot of what I'm doing is helping to make sure that what we see or what we think that we're, we're creating is actually what ends up on screen because it's really easy to make something that looks good on your monitor and then you see it in the movie and it's dark or it's weird or the colors have shifted or something is broken down or the quality has dropped somehow in ways that you don't expect. It's not obvious that these things will happen. And so my job is to help ensure that, you know, when James or Cullen, they design something and they put colors there, when you watch it back at home, that's what it looks like. It doesn't look different. There's no surprises. That, that's kind of what I'm responsible for in a lot of these cases. And in practice, that means finding out from the studio how they want their movie prepared. In this case, uh, they use Alexa cameras. They want it in the Alexa color space. And then how they want it delivered back. They actually, the whole movie is actually bigger than what you saw. So there's there's like a, like a small window around the whole picture that gets cropped off, which they use in order to make it in stereo 3D so they can offset it left and right for the eyes. So there's more picture there than what you think um, and also we did everything in 3K, even though you may be watching it in like HD or UHD, um, but the movie was mastered in 3K. Um, and how do we translate all that stuff um, so that it, it works and we get the right thing? The cool thing I'll, I'll say is actually that when I rewatched it on HBO Max, it looked just like how it looked when I was working on it on my computer. Um, with the exception of the shot of the guy, the CEO guy, um, that's on the TV, mm -hmm. uh, which I expected they would change because they took that shot from us earlier. But other than that, everything looked exactly the same, which is the goal. It doesn't always happen, but it, it looked exactly the same. And that's that's what you're, you're after, figuring out how to make sure that when you pick this red, that that's the red that ends up in the movie. Because the technologies are different. There's no guarantee that it will be. A, uh, a deceptively complicated and important part of, of making sure that we can all see it. And yeah, I think, look good. I think so many of us don't take that into consideration, the effort of the varying technologies to just get it to see what we're seeing. We're like munching on popcorn, like drinking a soda, you know. Mm -hmm. but I mean, think about awful. us and we're doing this podcast and what it takes to just to get us all to be separate and then record the audio right. well to put it back together. Like, There's more to it than just us talking. Um, and the more that's managed, the better your product is. And it's the same with this. So now we've all learned what a finisher is. Everybody <laughs> sees this, the show can be educational. I'm too. very grateful for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if this was covered in like the conspiracy approach, but I, earlier you mentioned something you're talking about intentionally bad design. And I wanted to make sure that we, we came back to that. Um, well, yeah, so part of that was that website, but we also, like James mentioned, we went through a lot of like uh, YouTube videos. So we, we did a lot of like thumbnails. So, you know, it would be something like, I think we had a, we made a whole like fake YouTube channel called like Hollow Home <laughs> or something. And, you know, it would be, it would just be like, and it, it, these would be like images, I think that we like took from the internet. So like fan art of like, like Rodin or something. And then we just put like a ton of question marks over the top. <laughs> or something like that or it was just it was just kind of like coincidence or conspiracy and there's just like things like that so we had a lot of those um we had a wikipedia page i think that was actually maybe based on uh i think it was tesla or something so we basically took all the information from that and then rewrote it for some of the other organizations that were in <laughs> here and i think we also had um another it was like an apex kind of like um product a Roomba, i think we had yes. or something like that yeah the Roomba and it was like 
oh, the, the, it's such a great, you know, it has such great features. Like I have like two cats and, you know, like, you know, like a whole handful of children. And somehow the Roombot's also like really good with them, like unnervingly good with them. Like the Roombot itself is, is, is like a good nanny or something like that. <laughs> I think we had a bunch of those things. And so it was, it was kind of riffing off of all these different designs. So some of them, like, you know, Wikipedia, we all know, we all know what that looks like, but things from that all the way to the bad design from like YouTube thumbnails or things like that, that are really just there to like well, get remember, you to look at them. Yeah, I remember bombarding James with a lot of um, like Angel Fire websites and uh, mm -hmm. yep. MySpace <laughs> pages or things. <laughs> <laughs> Those like really old crappy websites. Oh man, I missed that. And that would have been a nostalgia trip because, you know, I remember being five, six, seven years old and reading about Godzilla on the. In fact, I think one of them is still up. It's called Barry's Temple of Godzilla. If you want to look it up, it's like <laughs> oh, a, Googling a classic <laughs> of, of old Godzilla fan sites. And uh, yeah, it, uh, that would have been a trip. So I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get that, but what we ended up with, I, I love too. Um, yeah, you, you ended up with good design and stuff. <laughs> Barry's Temple of Godzilla says in parentheses on its homepage, I'm not dead yet. Dot, 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 dot. United Nations Godzilla Control Center danger. This is incredible, Ryan. Thank you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> does, uh, does anyone have any other fun details they want to throw in? I, uh... Uh, I'm pretty sure I got tinnitus from uh, the screening of Godzilla vs. Kong, so that's a fun detail. <laughs> Did you really? It was just surprisingly loud in that theater that where we watched it, and I remember it leaving, being like, "Oh, my ears are ringing," and to this day, they're still ringing, and it's a fun, <laughs> fun little uh, memory I have. <laughs> were, were, yeah, were you in one of those small like theaters yeah. that they have on sets where they're kind of? Yeah, I feel like they really go crazy with the sound when you're in there. It's like front row in one of those, just being like, yeah. oh, here, here it goes. You're like, they do know there are only 12 chairs in here, right? There's really <laughs> space for this. Yeah, it looks like with finishing, when stuff hasn't been mixed yet, like a lot of the editors will, will throw certain sounds way louder than they can actually electronically are supposed to go. <laughs> like for, <laughs> Nothing yeah, like a loud out. Godzilla scream coming in extra hot, yeah. Um, yeah, I, like I, I think I'll just throw in that like it. I think I think that this was a they were. Um, I don't want to say hands off. There were a lot of rounds of you know them giving feedback and hey, this is you know as as you want, you know that the filmmakers and you know and and uh, um, and improving stuff and change. You know, hey, this isn't uh, pertinent to the movie. So there's you know obviously a ton of input that the filmmakers are giving that Adam Wingard gave. Um, but I will say that they were very, that we were given a lot of, uh, freedom to try stuff, you know, so there was a ton of stuff that was kind of like, you know, Hey, this was an idea that we, you know, or, or, yeah, that, that we came up with and a solve for this thing that was, it wasn't like, you know, like even the, even the playoff bracket was a later edition. Hilariously. I think that we had kind of the sequence and then it was kind of like, well, we now have this whole, cause the, what we wanted to end it on doesn't make sense at the end. Uh, which was, I think, I think it was the the dome. I think that the the like ending with Kong in the dome was, you know, was kind of closer to the end. And it was like, well, we can't do that. So it's like we need this a thing. And I think we just sort of like, like, hey, maybe it's kind of like a, it's sort of like a, like a bracket, you know. And, and then and then like, you know, Adam Wingard was like, that's that's a good idea. Here's how I would even make that stronger. And you know, and and like and run with that and really like flesh it out and so and i think and he did that several times on the apex commercial as well so it was just it was like i'd say there was a lot of like freedom which is very fun there wasn't it wasn't prescriptive at all it really seems like as i said you guys had got a chance to really all put your fingerprints on it and i always think that art or creation is better when that gets to happen um uh, but it, there was also a nice overarching vision too uh so yeah, I'm. I I know that I don't know as much about these opening titles as as you guys do, and uh, I I certainly don't think the audience does. So it's it's been really fun getting to hear all these stories about how it came together. Yeah, and to hear like the the fun that you're able to have and the collaboration between your team and also with the rest of the creatives on on the rest of the project. I don't know if there's there's any you know story here, but. Sam, I, I seem to remember there was a point very early on where um, our boss Garson like 
wasn't even sure he wanted to pitch on this project. I think you're right. I can't remember for sure. I do. I do know that um, that my, I was extraordinarily excited yeah. to do a fake corporate commercial. More exciting than very on brand. <laughs> is that more exciting than working on a Godzilla movie? Don't answer it. I'm just kidding. I, 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 the, I, I don't want to get murdered by fans. Ed. Uh, <laughs> no, no. The fact that it was in a Godzilla movie. No, for for sure. Like I, but yeah, it, it wasn't what it what it started as wasn't what it ended. I mean, we like it end. We we have like six of the of the first eight minutes of. No, that's not true. Ten minutes. We we, we like did like maybe five of the first ten minutes mm-hmm. of the movie. You know, and and that's pretty cool. And I don't think we knew that going in. Definitely, um, you you get to set the tone for yeah. the whole thing, basically. I'll say we definitely uh, all deferred to Sam as the the in house Godzilla expert <laughs> during the whole process. Yeah, but but I will say that I deferred to everyone else as the people who actually have um, artistic ability to uh, to execute basically anything. I mean, that, that's the thing. That ultimately, all the animation, all the design you know is all done by this group and you know i can i can weigh in and be like maybe the godzilla does the blank and they're like oh (laughs) here's the perfect the perfect uh, execution of that meanwhile ryan's like which monsters were included in the piece that got cut i couldn't tell you i don't know i i wish i had been there but i would have been a terror to you all (laughs) constantly like hmm I think it was Baragon. I think it was Baragon. Oh, okay, I, cool. I could be wrong. Vera who? Um, which I, uh, isn't that the 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 T Rex looking boy? Uh, Gorosaurus? Do you mean? Or Gorosaurus? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Gorosaurus was the one I was thinking of. Um, yeah, because we it was something where we had to paint in these monsters, and so it was something that we had a, like good references of because someone had made like a you know a, a modern version of the thing, and we were like, oh, that, okay, that's kind of what he would look like now because he has to look. A, right in the world of the thing and so i think we then right. kind of like painted a version based on a modern version <laughs> of him and that was the one we found so you heard it, heard it here folks go complain to legendary that we didn't get gorosaurus introduced <laughs> into the monster <laughs> don't do not do that <laughs> i'm joking but please don't <laughs> it wasn't particularly close to ma- making it either it was, that was a pretty early on direct you know. all complaints to the apple podcast <laughs> review section <laughs> <laughs> don't do that either <laughs> i think I think too, just just to be corny, like however many decades ago when we started this podcast is what it feels like <laughs> to now have this point where we're like, oh yeah, our friend Sam and everybody works with worked on a project. Like it's pretty freaking cool when you think about it. So thank you guys for taking the time to chat us through all the little secret details and elements that we wouldn't have um, uh, known about otherwise. Because yes, we it was really, a... we, yeah, thanks for giving us the chance to talk about it. Yeah, well, it was a real treasure, and uh, it, even if I'm more than a little jealous, I'm, I'm not directly <laughs> in the movie. I'm glad at least that the Godzilla Angelus <laughs> got their stamp in there, and, and that it, it was such part of such a cool sequence. So, if, if seven year old Ryan could see us now, I, mean, <laughs> I know I would be over the moon, that <laughs> little guy. As a uh, as a conclusion, does everyone have a favorite Godzilla movie or or Kong movie? Skull Island. I've, Skull Island or 1998 Godzilla. You know me. <laughs> I was going to go with that one. I thought for sure you were going to say the original. <laughs> well, also the original. Can I have three? But I you, I got to have that Walkman piece in there. You know yeah. it. Oh, God. And Ryan, it, we know, everyone knows Joanna loves the 98 Godzilla. Yeah, this is no <laughs> secret. They know I love the original. They know I love King Kong. They know I love the 98. It's like it's the same track yeah. over and over. <laughs> And Ed, you were 98 Godzilla as well? I was going to say well. 98, just to be a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> but now oh. you're one of two jerks. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Colin, you got a favorite? So I do stand by Kong Skull Islands, but I think my just in, in my life overall, my favorite is probably uh, Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. Something like my introduction to... So good. I remember very little about the plot of the, of the whole movie, but my introduction to Godzilla was... We had them all. We had a bunch of them on VHS. Like me and my brother as kids, um, and I don't know something about just the imagery of all of this slime and this kind of rubbery creature. I don't know. 
had a formative impact on me. <laughs> Haunts him to this day. Yeah, that's it's probably why I still good. hate plastic bags to this day. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. We're no strangers to being fans of of that one. That we all love that one too. Oh, we yeah. covered that on the pod. But um, I remember when we were working on it. Each of us, when we started working on it, each of us changed our Slack icons to yes. different different Godzilla monsters. I think <laughs> Sam and James still have the them. Um, yeah, I, I haven't changed mine because I've forgotten. James, uh, which, which awesome. monster were you? I mean, it was classic monsters. Yeah. They weren't. They weren't. They, here's your, here's the answer that Ryan you were looking for. Here's our <laughs> our nod to the original series. But mine was definitely the Slack, the the small. My mine's the guy with the unicorn horn. I don't know who he is. <laughs> That's Baragon. Baragon. I uh, I have OG Congress is Godzilla Kong. Old sleepy <laughs> eyes, drunk Kong. The, nice. the dark Kong that I don't want to talk about ever. <laughs> That's my Steam icon still. Yeah. The old King Kong. <laughs> Greg, you got a favorite uh, a favorite Godzilla or Kong movie? Um, so it's a little close. So I don't know if this is valid, but I really enjoyed the most recent one. To be honest with you. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I like seeing the monsters think and like you know use tactics and things like that. I, I think you can let these people be characters; they don't have to, you know, just be whatevers. And so I, I appreciated the fact that we were able to empathize with Kong quite a bit in this one. That's uh, that's what it's all about for me. So I'm 100 mm-hmm. percent on board with that line of thinking. <laughs> and uh, and Mulan, you got you got one. You're putting me on a big spot. <laughs> I mean, you did create a cult to King Kong. I can't say that I'm very good at remembering which ones I've I, I've seen some, and I can't remember which ones they are. You're all gonna like hate me for this, but I can tell you that the first time I ever saw anything that has to do with any of this was when I was a little kid, and I remember looking up at the screen, and my dad's watching. I was like, what are these these ladies? They're like singing to this giant moth thing. What's that about? And then, so I think about that sometimes, and I think that was a really beautiful scene. So so that's what I will I will pull from right now. <laughs> yes. <Ryan>. yes. <laughs> I mean, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but they were my first crush, or the twin fairies. <laughs> worship. Also, Milan, don't feel bad, because I've watched many of these movies now, but sometimes Sam and Ryan and audience don't hate me for this. They'll call back a movie, and I'll be like, well, I don't think I've seen that one. And they're like, no, we recorded an episode on it. And I'll be like, okay, right, right, right. Yes, yes, yes. And, Correct. Yeah, and I only say that I remember to not anger Ryan, but I have no, no <laughs> recollection of them either. Some of them, there are, you know, some strong similarities with some of them, so it's hard to tell them apart sometimes. <laughs> And, well, audience, you know this, but fittingly enough, my favorite is still the original King Kong vs. Godzilla. It was the first one I ever saw. Um, but if you watch the Japanese version, it's still a lot of fun. Really fun, uh, smart satire, actually. But uh, this new one was great, too. So much fun. And again, thank you guys all for coming on. Thank you. And thank Sam, you. Do, you wanna, do you wanna lead out on our catchphrase? Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast, everyone. Uh, I know this was a was a uh, a different format than usual, but hopefully you enjoyed it or learned something. Um, and uh, as always, uh, keep spreading the word of Godzilla and Kong. Sometimes, yay! <laughs> yay! If you haven't yet, leave a nice comment or review wherever you like to listen. That would really help us out. That's it for this show, but we'll see you soon. In the meantime, keep spreading the word of Godzilla.